Now for the first time in history, not only can we get information directly from the brain, but some of that information is extraordinarily robust. Well, that's a game changer. It changes the way in which we get information from other human beings and raises a host of ethical and, by the way, interesting legal questions about things like privacy. So what functional MRI is giving us is a window into the brain, a window onto signals of the brain that we haven't been able to capture before. All of these things we're seeing as essentially pictures that light up or signals that light up in pictures. They're very powerful. They need to be interpreted very cautiously. But there's, there are stories to be told through these images and the media appreciates that and the media is doing its best to convey that information to the public through these images. There's a long way to go in communicating the meaning of those signals better to the public. Um, but we're working on that. The public is sometimes fed these rather horrific stories about how, I, just let me put you in a brain scan and I can tell you know, whether you're having sex uh, apart from your wife or I can tell whether you're lying when I ask you a question. It's crap. Now, of course, there's always entrepreneurs who want to make money selling snake oil, God bless them. Uh, so they should try but we should not buy into it. So I have been called a snake oil salesman. Um, it surprises me. Uh, it's disheartening in the sense that from the scientific point of view, scientists should work together and not call each other names. In fact, much of the work that we've done hasn't swayed anybody's you know, opinion over the last five years. So we publish all these papers in the scientific journals and we still have this tremendous bias that exists. You know, we're not that far away. There are already experiments where um, by looking at someone's brain they can tell whether they're thinking about a square or a circle or, or they can get a rough idea of what they're seeing or what color they're, they're seeing or something like that. I think what will get the slippery slope started will be, for instance, now there are more powerful lie detection techniques that are being tested. That They're already more powerful than the polygraph. If your accuracy is anywhere below 100%, should it have a role in court? Uh, what should its role be? But I think that ultimately, you know, if materialism's right, ultimately it would be possible to achieve an accuracy rate of 100%. What the basis of uh, non-self-incrimination is in the United States? Is it that you have a right not to uh, act against your interest, or is it uh, an attempt to keep people from from being tortured and coerced into saying things, right? Is it on the surface, uh, what kind of right is it? And uh, where does that stem from and what, uh, when can we subvert that for the, the public good or need to? And what's so interesting about it is a brain image that can apprehend subjective thought is neither testimonial nor non-testimonial. It exists in a category that we have not yet defined. So it isn't that the courts are going to have to discover which one it is. The courts are going to have to decide which category to put it in, um, which will be based on, in some sense, virtually arbitrary criteria. FMRI is uh, relatively non-invasive, so uh, physically non-invasive. I mean, the argument is that it's extremely invasive because it invades the very internal brain states that uh, that can possibly tell you something about the, your thoughts. It's just false that we don't understand the relationship between the mind and the brain, really. And it's false that this isn't going to be, there's not going to be significant progress in these areas. So we might as well start dealing with them now. The skull should be an absolute zone of privacy. I don't even believe a court order should allow um, you to uh, brain image someone and get subjective thought against their will. We might want to make it sort of a universal principle that this should never be done to anyone without their consent. 
because once we cross that border, you know, we've lost something that in a way is the most valuable thing we have. You know, even the most wretched prisoner enduring torture still has the option of keeping the information to himself. But if that disappears, it's really going to change things, you know. Um, and it, it's, it is a threat to our human nature, so we might want to consider a sort of a universal law of non-interference with conscious states unless people want to do it. It's a very special kind of privacy that we have, um, the privacy of our, of our conscious minds. And, but as you can tell, this merely brings up ethical problems, serious ethical problems, right? If privacy means anything at all, it means the right to the content of, of my mind. And for the state to even think about entering there, it seems to me such a profound violation of privacy that, and, and, and yet so tempting for the state and so tempting for jurisprudence um, that I think we're going to need very, very strong protections against state incursion. You know, defense technology, for example, what are we doing with soldiers? You know, um, are we going to be able to implant um, particular desires in our soldiers or increase their aggressive behavior, for example? I mean, the, a large amount of money is going towards this sort of research by DARPA. The fact that we can so simply and reliably change aspects of ourselves with a pill or with a, you know, zap of the transcranial magnetic stimulator or whatever, really, I think... Um, it, uh, yeah, it sort of shakes that sense of having an enduring, constant self. The possibility of serious enhancement is a real worry with regard to what it means to be human. If we have this ability to um, interfere or enhance our cognitive system such that we don't have serious mental illnesses or we don't have um, real highs and lows even in our emotional states, would that somehow undermine the human experience, right? Um, will that change what it means to be human? But you could have argued that with SSRIs too. These mood enhancing drugs, you know, if you go on antidepressants, your life experience has changed. And it would be the same with neuroscientific interventions. However, those might be permanent. But it's very hard to find the place that, that you can draw a line and say, this side of the line is um, uh, the person has an illness, they have a disorder, and um, it needs to be treated. And this side of the line, the person just has a sort of lifestyle complaint, and um, anything we give them for that is enhancement. Um, any place you draw the line, it's just going to be arbitrary. There's always something lost in gain. That's what's interesting about ethics. Ethical dilemmas are always, for me, what are we willing to give up to preserve, preserve something important? So we give up something important in order to preserve something. That's how it will always be with enhancement. You know, we are going to focus on one thing at the detriment of another. And we just have to be comfortable with that loss. I think it's, you know, in some sense it's not a question of should they. I mean, they will. It's, uh, it's human nature to try to, you know, improve things, improve the world around you and improve yourself. And I think we're seeing that already. We're not just the, the passive um, recipients of our brain's information. We are our brains in a very fundamental way. And it's all part of a dynamic set of systems about how we behave. And ultimately, there is no one to take responsibility for that behavior but us. Another possibility is it'll entail a complete um, radical upheaval in our views of science and neuroscience and all of that. So it's a bit like saying maybe mind and brain are like maybe two sides of a coin or maybe mind and brain are like two sides of a Mobius strip which on local inspection look like two different things. But if you knew the whole picture, you would say, in fact, hey, it's a Mobius strip, okay? So maybe mind and brain are related in that manner. There's some logical relationship which we don't understand yet. But once you have the right framework, then, then maybe you'll understand what qualia is and consciousness is. And so, you think about this brain, you think about like your conscious thoughts are what you recognize. But, you know, whether it comes to identifying people's faces and your self reporting on that, recognizing patterns, 
or recognizing you know, whether you're going to change your behavior, your brain's a better predictor than your conscious you know, reporting of that. To me, that's really fascinating. What it will affect is our understanding of who we are as people. Um, and then our understanding of who we are as people might affect our view and our appreciation of our ethical values. More is better, at least more quality knowledge is better. It brings us to understanding the human condition, human disease, what motivates us and what drives us. Um, that will help shape our thinking about people. The question is, what is human? And I think to answer that, something that psychologists need to do a better job of is understanding evolution. Um, because once you understand evolution, you begin to understand that being human is actually not that special. And as you look at, even within recorded history, every scientific advance has made humans less special. We're not a special planet. We're not a special species. Um, our brain isn't that special. Our DNA isn't that special. Um, and what we've started to find out with the advent of neuroimaging is that our decision making isn't that special. Our ethics aren't that special. Our morals aren't that special. Um, our language isn't that special. And that it's, it's becoming harder and harder uh, at least scientifically to convince yourself that humans are actually that special. I don't have a great definition of what it means to be human, but I will say something about the way in which we think about it in neuroscience that I think is misguided. We are very cerebrocentric in the West. So we think that if you took my brain and you put it in Joe's body and threw his brain away, that that resulting hybrid would be me and not Joe. That it would have my memories, my ideas, it would think of my family as its family. Um, well, that is a theory, and it's also a very um, historically and socially situated theory. Even right now in some other cultures, their view of selfhood is not so cerebrocentric. And when I look at it, the evolutionary scale, it's a blip, and I'm glad that I'm in that blip. <laughs> it's very nice, but I do understand that it's a blip. We are a species that's capable of genocide, rape, murder and the alarming part is we're also a species capable of extinguishing ourselves so if you look on societies like easter island we are a species that's capable of cutting down that last tree and saying wow how did that last tree get cut down that's kind of a shame that we cut it down i think we're in trouble um, and so we are a species capable of absolutely annihilating ourselves too so hopefully we can overcome uh you know <laughs> Our, uh, our, our, our brain and make some uh, very smart decisions that we have to make in the next few years about what we're going to be as a race. I'm simply saying that we kind of take it for granted that all that we are, think, everything that makes us ourselves is, is centered in that three pounds of flesh between our ears. And yet we have deep, rich um, nervous system that goes through our, our bodies. The largest neural set that we have outside of our brain is in our gut. Who knows how much of what makes me me lives somewhere else in my body. So um, we're in a period right now where, where we're very focused on the brain and where we put an enormous amount of, of um, belief in, its, in, in what it represents for us. But I think like all other things, we're going to find out it's a lot more complex than that.